But the topic of this message today is courageous faith. Courageous faith. You might not find that those two words together in your Bible, courageous faith, but you always find the word courageous or courage, and you always find the word faith. And as I was studying this text, I noticed that these two can go together. It's kind of like grits and gravy. Just make it better. You can eat grits by themselves, but you got a little gravy, man. It's just a little bit better. So courageous faith. And as we study this text and listen to this text today, we're going to see why these two go so closely together. But first, let me tell you this. Courageous. Let's take a look at courageous. Courageous is acting on what you believe regardless of your circumstances. Acting on what you believe regardless of your circumstances. We all have some sort of circumstances. And as we go through this text, we're going to see where a couple of these characters had some circumstances that they were dealing with. Faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when I think about faith, I think about the substance. What is the substance of my faith? The word of God is my substance. Because if I'm believing in anything other than the word, I'm believing in vain. Amen? So the substance of my faith is the word. And the, and the evidence of my faith is my belief. Because I'm believing, though, what I do not see, even though I have already received it. That's faith. So these two go together. Faith, the Bible tells us in Hebrew 11.6, that faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he comes, he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he that, listen to this, and he that, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So your faith, if you're seeking God in faith, you are going to get a reward. You are going to get a reward. He said it. I'm just repeating what he said. Now, let me tell you the story, the, the setting of this context. This context is about two main characters. Well, we know Jesus is always the main character, Jesus. But this is about Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood. Now, what I love about this story is the contrast. I have heard this story this text taught before when it was mainly about the woman with the issue of blood. But I have never heard it in context with both of these characters. But when you put both of these characters together, it brings you the full picture of what God is trying to tell us. Now, God, you can take the scripture. It only has one interpretation, but there are many applications. And it was so many applications. Come on, say, Lord, help me with this. But this is... These two main characters, let's read the scripture in Luke 8, 40. The scripture says, now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter. Everybody say only daughter. He had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. And as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. Now that word press, you'll find it in the King James as, 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 as a, it's not as the word press, but as thorg, thorn, thorn. T-H-R-O-N-G, throng, throng. They throng him. And that throng, listen to this, and that throng pressing now, that throng means they were pressing so hard, the crowd was so great, they were pressing so hard until they were pressing almost to the point of suffocation. So that's how thick and congested this crowd was that were walking with Jairus and Jesus. And remember that. Now, it, the scripture said in the beginning, Jesus returned. What did he return from? He returned from a place called, it was the land of the Gaudians. 
in, 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 in that land, in that city, it was a city of, of Gentiles. So that's where he was, and that's where he met the man who had a, a demonic spirit. And Jesus, as we know, he freed the man of the demonic spirit. The spirit went in, requested to go into the pigs. The pigs ran over the cliff and were drowned. And the man was so elated and so happy he wanted to follow Jesus around. But Jesus said, no, you go out and tell what has happened here. In other words, you go out and be my witness. You go out and tell your testimony because we need to hear people's testimony. When Jesus had done something great, you need to tell your testimony because there's a, a, a hurting soul that needs to hear that testimony. So he went on and began to tell it. Now listen to this. The people there implored, implored means to beg and plead. Please leave Jesus. Get out of here. If they had only known who Jesus really were, they would have begged him to stay. Now, maybe they asked him to leave because of the pigs. It was a financial hardship. I don't know. But Jesus could have given them hundreds of thousands of pigs if they had only known, if they had only had faith. But the contrast is the story. Jesus returned to where? Capernaum. Now, Capernaum... He was, they said, the, the scripture said he was welcome there. So they, they knew who Jesus were. Now this is where the crowd of people were. This is where Jairus was. Jairus was a synagogue worker. Now the synagogue worker, working in the synagogue, he probably, today's, we would we probably classify him as a, uh, as a, as a, a deacon or, or someone who took care, the administrative things of, of, of the synagogue. But scholars also say that um, they believe Jairus was there when Jesus was there healing people on the Sabbath day. And people were asked, imploring him to leave, or they were plotting against Jesus at that time. So you see the contrast here. Even though now, I call Jairus, when I was in Germany, I had a pastor. He was an undercover. He, he, he told us, he said, you know, when I was in college, I was an undercover Christian. Anybody here ever been an undercover Christian? Let me explain. Undercover Christian means that I'm a Christian, but I don't want my friends to know right now because they may ostracize me or, you know, they might not want to hang out with me anymore. You know, they, you know, they have names for you, like Jesus Freak and all this other kind of stuff. But anyway, he said he was an undercover Christian for a long time. You know, undercover Christian, like, you go out with your friends, you sit down at the table, you know you need to say your, normally you're at home, you say your grace like this or whatever, but you're out with your friends, you say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You'd be silent. You had that second minute of silence, you know, because you're afraid to, to, to show Jesus in front of your friends. But think about Jairus. He was working in the synagogue. Now he comes and throws himself down in front of Jesus. Why did he do that? He's a Jew, and he worked in the synagogue. He risked probably losing his job and everything. Everything was at risk. But he threw himself down. That tells me that he was in a desperate situation. When desperation comes, you would do desperate things. And this desperation, that's why I call this courageous, because he had to have some sort of courage to get out there being a Jew, working in the synagogue, and throw himself down, knowing that he could be ostracized, kicked out, or talked about, or lose his job. But he did it anyway. Courageous faith. Now, there was a woman with the issue of blood. The woman with the issue of blood, Jesus decided to go with Jerry. Okay, Jerry, I'm going with, let's go heal your daughter. But did Jesus, did he have to do that? Wait, do it that way? Because remember the centurion? Remember the centurion? His faith was so great, he came to Jesus and said, just speak the word. You have authority. I know, I have authority. I know how it works. Just speak the word. So Jesus, Jerry could have just said, Jesus, speak the word, but because of his faith, his, 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 um, his uh, amount of faith, I guess you can call it amount of faith, or his, his, his faith that he had at that time, he wanted him to go with him to his house. And now the woman, but on the way, Jesus met a woman, the woman with the issue of blood. She, the Bible says she had an issue of blood for 12 years. 12 years, she's been suffering. Now, Jairus had a daughter who was 12, 12, 12. So I love how this story contrasts. Jairus had a daughter who was 12, and the woman had issue of blood. So for 12 long years, Jairus enjoying his, his daughter. They're having a wonderful time. 
Life is good. Now, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, been suffering for 12 years. See the contrast? Been suffering for 12 years. Suffering. The Bible says she wasted all her money going to every doctor in town. Suffering. But this lady was at a point of desperation. Jairus was at a point of desperation. So, when was the last time you were at a point of desperation? You might be at a point of desperation now. I don't know what you have going on in your life, but I know who's in control of life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, oh gracious God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the enlightenment. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Father. We thank the way, uh, how you can just heal us the way that you want to heal us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. We pray that your word will fall on ears and hearts that will receive you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the question is, how to have a courageous faith in Jesus in the midst of desperation? How can I have a courageous faith? Courageous means I would do, regardless of my situation, I'm going to do what I believe in. I'm going to act upon what I believe, regardless of the situation. Like Jerry, he was a working in the synagogue, but regardless of that, he forgot about that. He fell at Jesus' feet, humbled himself. Now, the scripture says, let's look at number one. The scripture says, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed anymore. Luke 8, 43. This woman was in a desperate situation condition. But listen to this. Keep in mind, Jesus and Jairus walking with this crowd pressing in on them, trying to move. And Jairus, he's feeling good right about now. Okay, my daughter's going to be here finally. And they run upon this woman. There's a delay in the process, a delay in the journey. How many times have you been looking and seeking Jesus for something, you're dealing with this thing and seeing like there's a delay. It's just not getting done. How many times? Expect delays. Number one is be patient. Be patient. Tolerate delay. Don't give up. Delays sometimes make us want to give up and stay focused. Stay focused on what? What you believe in. And what you believe in is Jesus. Stay focused. This woman was in a desperate situation. Her bleeding made her ceremonially unclean. And that's why I call this woman a courageous woman, courageous faith, because anything that she touched was going to be considered unclean. Anywhere she sat was going to be considered unclean. And even if she went and, and, and deliberately touched someone, she was in deep trouble. Now, just accidentally touching someone, you're, you're, you're unclean, and then you have to, you're going to be unclean until the evening, and then you will be considered clean again, but not the woman. As long as she had the flow of blood, she was considered unclean. And after seven days, after the blood stopped, she had to take two doves to the priest, and the priest take the dove and do a sin offering and all this good stuff, and then she was considered clean. So those were the laws. There was some kind of religious faith, the religious ideas, religious now I'm talking about, can hold us back. Think about it. That's what she's dealing with. But she's taking a risk. She's taking a risk. Why is she taking a risk? The woman is taking a severe risk. She went to the doctors to get better, but only suffered worse. Now, when a soul is sick today, what happened? There are many kinds of doctors. There's a doctor everywhere. There's a doctor in appeal for just about everything that you can think of. Anybody ever listen to old commercials on TV when they're advertising in medicine? And there's so many side effects, you say, what was that pill for? <laughs> I do it all the time. I go like, what was it? I ask my wife. She, my wife got a fantastic memory. She doesn't remember. I go like, goodness. The only way to remember is close your eyes. Because they have these little beautiful things, scenery going on, so it's detract, distract you. But there are so many doctors, and people go to the doctor for a little bit of everything, but yet they are, they are treated, but they are not healed. 
So if we want to be healed, who we got to see? Only Dr. Jesus can give us true and lasting healing. Romans 12, 12 says, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Persevering and patient. Sometimes, I mean, let's get clear on persevering and patient. Patient doesn't mean I sit there and twiddle my thumb. Patient is actually it's an active word. It is to continue, continue in a course of action even in the face of difficulties and despair. I'm having patience because I'm going to continue my belief. I'm believing in Jesus. I'm believing in the word. I'm having patience. I'm going to continue on this course of action despite my circumstances. Despite my circumstances. If you are trusting and believing God to work something out for you that you're dealing with, then persevering and patience means that you're continuing believing God as though you have already received that thing that you're hoping him for. In other words, God is saying, keep on believing. Keep on believing means continuous belief. Do not allow doubt to creep into your belief or creep into what the word says. Keep on believing. Keep on believing. That's courageous faith. Matthew 9, 21 says, For she was saying, this is the woman now. Remember, Jairus and Jesus are walking, but he, he, there's a delay because he met a woman. That's like, listen to this. That's like you have a, an emergency situation. You go somewhere and, and, and get the EMS. You're in the EMS wagon on your way uh, to pick up your child. And there's someone on the side of the street flagging them down. And EMS pulls over. And you're going like, man, I can't believe this. That's what he was faced with. But anyway, here we go. With the woman with the issue of blood, she was saying to herself, if only I can touch his garment, I will be well. She's focused on Jesus and began to exercise her faith in her heart. In her heart. It was a heart thing. She did not speak it. She could have spoken it and said, well, uh, or she could have just prayed to Jesus. But God, Jesus is showing, this text is showing us there are many ways to get, to, to get healing, uh, to, to uh, make contact with Jesus. Um, and she said, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. She did not speak it out loud, as Jairus did. You know, he spoke it out loud. Jesus, come with me. So, let's look at number two. Be willing to risk everything to reach out to Jesus and gain everything. Be willing to risk everything to reach out to Jesus to gain everything. Because sometimes when we're going through some stuff, we're reaching out, we, we, we think, it feels like I'm taking a chance, I'm taking a risk. The late Jairus, he was taking a risk by reaching out, he was risking his job. The lady with the issue of blood, she was risking being flogged and beaten and everything because she was, she was ostracized. She wasn't supposed to be out with people socially. She, wasn't, she was just supposed to be in her home because she couldn't touch anybody. So she was taking a, a great risk by getting out there. And the word says, she came up behind him and touched in faith. Okay, this is a faith touch. The fringe. Now, fringe here is tassel on his garment, the outer garment. God uh, told Moses to tell the brothers of Israel to put four tassels on their outer garment so they can remember the Ten Commandments, I mean, the, not ten, but the commandments, so that they will act on those and not on their own way of thinking. So she probably knew that. So that's the significance of the tassel that were hanging from uh, Jesus' garment, outer garment. They say cloak or skull or whatever. But anyway, the thing is, the risk, according to the Jewish law of the time, this woman touched, if she touched anyone, she imparted uncleanliness to them. Now, she was taking a risk, and she knew the deal. If she touched Jesus, she knew, or anyone else, in her mind, she's thinking, I'm going to, you know, make them unclean. But I have a desperate situation. I'm reaching out to him. You can find that in Leviticus 15, 
uh, chapter 19, I mean, chapter 15, verse 19 through 31, all about what the woman had to do, her uncleanness, and how she got reclaimed. So she reached out to Jesus because she had heard about him. She believed in the healing power of Jesus and the border of the garment of the fringes served as a, I call this servant as a point of contact or activation for her faith. Now, activating your faith, the Bible says faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when I hear the word, my faith should be activated at that time. But sometimes, people remember, anybody remember Reverend Ike in the prayer cloth? I remember my mom, bless her heart, she, she used to get those prayer cloths. She believed in Jesus, but she, if I just got that prayer cloth, you know, whatever I'm believing, whatever I need, it's going to be okay. So this woman thinking she believed, but her point, her, to activate her, her faith would not activate until she touched that garment. Not activated. But the correct way is that your faith is activated. But if you don't know, you don't have the knowledge, your faith is activated if you truly believe when you hear the word. Because that's what the Bible says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, she and, and Luke 8, 45 says, and, and Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. In other words, the crowd is following you. They're, they're just pressing on you. Everybody touching you. Everybody touching you. Why did Jesus ask this question? I love that part because Jesus always asks questions. There are many questions that Jesus asks in the Bible. And when he, you know, he already knows the answer to it, but he asks those questions. I believe it's for the teaching of those who hear. When Jesus asks a question, it's for those, the teaching of those who hear. It comes as, sometimes it comes as, as, a, uh, as, as, as a testimony. Or, or it just enlightened those around who are hearing the answer that the person give or the answer that Jesus give. And also it's for Jesus' glory, because he's going to be glorified. Now, Peter and the disciples did not understand the difference between casual contact with Jesus and reaching out to him in faith. They did not understand that, because he was saying, everybody's touching you. But can you imagine this lady, people press, anybody ever been in a crowd with just people just pressing on you? That's the way it was. My, the thing that fascinates me, how did this lady manage to squeeze between people when they're pressing so hard, it's almost pressing the, the, the air out of people? How does she do it? Desperate situation, courageous faith. Can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine because a, a group of people, all these people, they're pressing on Jesus, bumping against Jesus, and when this woman says that, you know, she's been healed, and someone in the crowd said, well, I bumped against Jesus. I was not healed. Or someone said, I touched him. I'm not healed. And then the old question come out like my little grandson would say, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> Why was I not healed? Why was I not healed? Why did I not get it? But there is a huge difference between bumping into Jesus and casually touching Jesus and reaching out to him in faith. You can come to church week after week. You can go to Bible study week after week and bump into Jesus and casually touch Jesus and still not be healed or your faith is still not activated. It isn't the same as reaching out to him in faith touching him in faith. How do we reach out and touch Jesus in faith? Through our belief. Through our belief. When faith is activated in your mind through the word of God. But Jesus said, someone touch me for I perceive that power has gone out from me. That power did not, it's not saying that power went out and Jesus got weak. It means that what Jesus is saying, someone touch me in faith 
And Jesus received it in his, a heart touched him and in faith and Jesus received it in his heart that someone is healed. Someone is healed. How many of you are reaching out to Jesus in faith right now? How many are reaching out in faith? Touching him in faith. You, we touch him through our belief. But sometimes the religious system calls us to set up a point of faith activation. Some people believe, and it's okay, because Jesus knows your heart. Some people believe, well, if I can only do this, I believe in Jesus, but if I can only do this, I'll be healed, or he'll answer my prayer. If I can only just stand at the altar, that's where Jesus is, I'm going to be healed. It's okay if you believe that, as long as you, Jesus is the main focus. Jesus is the, 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 the source. We have to make sure our source is right. Now, if the altar is your source, we're out of touch. But if Jesus is your source and you're coming to the altar, that just means that the altar is your activation point that activate your faith. Jesus knows like the woman touching activated her faith. Jesus going with Jairus to his home activated his faith. But Jesus, there are many ways that Jesus can heal. When the woman touched Jesus and was immediately healed, Jesus felt something happen. Jesus had a sense that someone had been healed. Number three, be humble and courageous. Your blessing is on the way. And we got to already remember that your blessing is on the way. Because what does the scripture say in Hebrew eleven six? Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is a reward of those who seek him. So be humble and courageous. Your blessing is on the way. Luke 8, 47 says, And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, okay, some people say she was sneaking up on Jesus, trying to steal something to go on back. Because, she, you know, I don't, I don't like to call it steal. I think she was just afraid. Because she knew the consequences as she was caught touching someone with the issue of blood. I'm going to get flogged. I'm going to get thrown in jail. I'm going to get this and this and that. It's going to be an adverse event. But this woman took the risk. She took the chance with her courageous faith. Now, and when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. That's, a, that's an act of humbleness. And declared, that's her testimony, in the presence of all the people, why she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. Mark 5, 32 says, he looked around. He looked around her to see her who had done this thing. Anybody ever been somewhere when somebody, you knew somebody touched you and you look around, who touched me? And you, you kind of know who did it and you look right up, look them right in the face, who touched me? And my wife always said, a hit dog will holler. So I guess that means, like, if you ask that question, it goes out. People say, <laughs> they say, yeah, okay, I, I did it. Now, it took bold action for this woman to admit that she did it. How many of you can take bold actions like that? What if you're on your job and someone says, who talked about Christ in here? You going to cow down? Or are you going to say, I did it? 